Hello. Okay. Okay. First, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this series. It's a, it's really a great pleasure and honor. Um, I'm going to tell you about the work my lab does. We we do a lot of work developing algorithms and computational workflows for detecting evolutionary relatives. And there have been some new developments, new methods, and a lot of new data. And I, I want to say a little bit about that because I think it's exciting and the change the evolutionary landscape in some sense and, and what we can understand about evolution and how it affects function. Um, and then I want to give uh, two examples of how we use our evolutionary data, our family data and structural data that we have in our resource to understand the impacts of genetic variations, uh, first in COVID and then in um, lung cancer, which we've been analyzing as well. So I just want to remind you of the value of protein structure the sequence folds up into these um, very compact three-dimensional domain shapes. This is just the trace of the polypeptide chain that you can see on the right. Um, and when you put the atoms onto the uh, proteins, uh, onto the protein backbone, you can see even more the value of having a three-dimensional structure. You can see there's a very deep pocket in this protein, and this deep pocket has a, a, a ligand, a substrate bound into it. You can see by looking at the chemical properties of the residues, the positive patches in blue, negative in red. So you can see the chemical nature of the pocket as well and what sort of compounds might bind into it. And this is why we've always been interested in, in the structure of these protein domains, these functional units. And we developed this with, with Janet Thornton, a, a, a classification called CAF that detects um, evolutionary related proteins using the structural information because it's so highly conserved. And just to show you an example, a subset of one of our evolutionary families, um, you can see this blue region, this structural core that's present in all the homologues. It's a structural fingerprint, a fossil for the family. Uh, you can see that um, you can have multiple copies of a family. So these uh, multiple homologues, these paralogs here for human, um, sometimes the structures and therefore the functions can diverge a bit. And sometimes between orthologs, yeast and human, you can get divergence in structure and function as well. So we have a whole suite of tools that we use, and I'm not going to describe any algorithms in detail today, but just to give you a flavor of concepts, you can see that um, really the performance, you want a straight line at the top here, you want high precision for everything that you find. But you can see that the methods that we use that are based on this SSAP algorithm perform competitively with other algorithms like uh, Strukdal and TM Align, which sort of round about here on the plot. Um, which we include as well. So we use multiple methods and machine learning strategies to combine the uh, to combine the scores. But we also use sequence information, and that can be useful for validating homologs. Because we can see that when we have enough relatives and we can align these relatives, we start to see patterns of conservation. The height here is how conserved the residues are, and these patterns of conservation are residues that are very constrained during evolution because they're important for the folding or the stability of the protein. Sometimes they're important for some functional characteristic as well. And they're very distinctly sequenced patterns. And we can transform this pattern into a hidden Markov model. It's a sort of mathematical construct, but it gives us a very good way also of finding homologs. So we use structural information first, but we also validate with sequence patterns. And the sequence patterns then help us bring in proteins for which we have no structure yet. But there are millions more proteins where we have the sequence data, no structure. We only have about half a million structures in CAF. But using these sequence patterns, we can take all known uniprot sequences, we can scan them against the patterns, and we can pull in many more proteins into our CAF resource. So 300 fold expansion in the sequence information and, and in the data we have in our families. And they obviously also bring in a lot of functional information as well. So it allows us to enrich the functional information in our resource too. Um, and I'll also tell you why that sequence data is important in, in a bit. Um, we can see having done this classification that actually uh, about 1% of the families counted for nearly half the data, all the data are, can be incredibly, um, they're very highly populated. They're found in multiple species. They have, often have multiple copies within a genome. But you can also see that these copies um, very frequently are, are diverging in structure and function. And you can see for this family, although the structural core in green is conserved, you can see considerable divergence outside that structural core. Um, and this correlates very often with functional difference. And we're really interested in how function evolves. 
So we want to subclassify our superfamilies into functional families. Um, and so this is an example superfamily. And of course, if we knew the functions, that would be easy. We could just cluster together all the relatives that have similar functions. We could generate a tree of relationships very easily, but we don't know the function. So less than 1% of proteins have their functions experimentally characterized. And so what we have to do is use the sequence data. The sequence data is vast, as I've shown you. And we have an algorithm which, first of all, clusters things that are very, very highly similar in sequence. And then it builds a sequence pattern, and then it compares these sequence patterns between clusters to work out whether they are similar enough to be merged or not. So we use, uh, we use um, Johannes Soding's very nice HMM, HMM strategies for doing this. Um, this allows us to generate these hierarchical relationships. And then we have to decide whether or not we want to merge clusters. That's the really tricky bit. And again, I'm not going to go into details with the algorithm, but the concepts behind it are that we can compare the patterns we get for these different functional families, for these different functional clusters, rather, um, and, and work out whether the patterns are similar enough. And what we see are there are some residue positions that are conserved actually often across the whole superfamily. These are often very important for the folding, the packing, the stability. Sometimes they are key functional residues that are present in all homologues. But we can also see that there are other positions where they're conserved in a particular functional cluster, they're conserved in the other functional cluster, but they're conserved in different ways. And we use various strategies within our algorithm to pick these out. We also benefit from Mona Singh's very nice entropy-based approach to this. And this allows us to segregate functional clusters that have very different um, sequence patterns in these key positions, these key functional determinants, as we call them. Now, um, we have about 220,000 of these functional families that we've uh, detected so far. We validated them in a number of ways. We can see not all of them have a structure. So the superfamily as a whole will have structures in it. But I've told you there's 300 times more sequence data than structure data. So, not, so the functional families are identified purely by sequence. And sometimes they don't have a structural representative. Where they do, we can see that these superimpose incredibly well. They usually superimpose within two angstroms. And you can, use, you can see here, this is a very good example where the substrate binding mode is very conserved. The, the residues binding the substrate are also highly conserved. But we need more structures, and I'll come back to that in a bit. We can also see that they're functionally pure. We haven't tested this. There's an independent competition assessment called CAFA. And there have been four rounds of this, and we've been highly ranked in all four rounds, I would say. This is round three. And for round four, I think we did actually, uh, we came top in some of the categories. So it's this very sensible way of organizing the functional relatives within an evolutionary superfamily, but it's not perfect. So the, these are not perfect results. It's just one of the, uh, it's a good way of doing it at the moment, but we need to improve it. So one of the ways we're trying to improve it is to use sequence data in a somewhat different way. Um, and this is a collaboration with Burkhard Rost and his team. And I should thank in particular Maria Lippmann and Michael Heinzinger, um, who've been helping us with this. And using this very nice uh, new um, deep learning method developed by the group, um, actually, uh, I'm going to show you a uh, proper tougher, I think, in this particular case, but we've tried all these different uh, methods that they use. And these deep learning methods transform the protein sequence into a vector of features. I'm not going to explain it in great detail. I'm not sure I understand it in great detail. But these, these vectors capture information which is particularly um, important. For example, the context of the residue, the, 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 in some sense of the, the residues that are nearby, and, and, and perhaps even the context structurally as well. And I'll come on to that in a minute when I show uh, another slide. So what we can see by using these methods is that we can actually take the embedding that we have for each sequence. We can take this vector we have for each sequence. And if we compare the vectors, we can get some idea of whether they're evolutionary related and even whether they're functionally related. And we can see, um, as you, I'm only showing five superfamilies here, but we tested it on a larger scale. But you can see the distances between evolutionary relatives we can capture here, and between functional relatives are even lower. So that we could see that using this embedding information and using the embedding distances, we could actually get a better idea of functional relatives. And we could use this to improve our functional families, to get a finer classification of functional families. So this is one strategy we're using to, to try and improve our functional family information. 
Why do we want to do that? Well, in, for this talk, one of the reasons why we want to do it is because we want to understand how changes in structure and, uh, can alter changes in functions of the proteins. And for that, we need to know something about uh, whether the, the um, mutations, uh, and in particular, we're looking at disease mutations, obviously, uh, often, uh, whether they can they, they lie in positions in the structure that might alter the function of the protein. Now we have very little information. There's very little experimental data about functional sites. So a lot of the time you have to predict these functional sites. And here I'm showing an example where we could predict catalytic residues in, in, in blue. We could predict the ligand binding residues in yellow. And we could see that there was in fact a disease mutations, in this case, cancer mutations, lying very close to these functional residues and therefore possibly having a, um, an impact and, and driving the disease in some way. Now, if we hadn't clustered our proteins into functional families, we may have missed these conservation signals. So I've showed you already that if we had merged these two functional families, these positions would not be so highly conserved. And actually there are more dramatic, dramatic cases where this arginine in one functional cluster may have switched to a negatively charged serine in the other. So by separating and by um, generating the functional families as accurately as possible, we can get a better idea of where these predicted functional sites lie. But we can also see that um, proximity in the structure is, is, is an important clue as well. And so we've tried to improve our functional site detection methods by using structural data as well. And here we're using a, a different machine learning approach, gradient boosted decision trees, which we found work quite well in a number of contexts actually. And we're combining structure features and sequence features and in particular, sequence conserved information on sequence conserved residues from our functional families. Um, I think it's difficult, it still remains a difficult challenge how to predict these residues. Catalytic residues, so our method is in red. And again, you want the line to be as close to the top as possible. Um, and you can see that um, we're competitive with other methods. Um, we, it's very hard to find other publicly available methods that you can get to run and that you can benchmark against. But again, we could see also with the uh, ligands, we're, we're, we're competitive, but it's harder. It's harder to predict ligand binding residues. And it's also very hard to predict interface residues. But again, by combining the structural data with evolutionary data, we can see that we're getting a competitive performance. But what was interesting to us as well was what were the features that were contributing to these performances. Um, we can see for catalytic residues, sequence conservation information figured quite highly. These residues do tend to be very highly conserved during evolution. So that data is very helpful in predicting those sites. We can see for ligand binding that it's very helpful as well. It's top ranked, but also structural features are becoming more important. Some of them more important than the other um, sequence conservation features we use. And for interface residues, it's even clearer that the structural data is more useful. Although sequence conservation does figure, it tends these residues tend to be less highly conserved evolutionary than ligand binding or catalytic. But so it's clear, it was clear to us that structural data is very important and we need more structural data for our functional families. So we were very excited by the recent news and I'm sure other people in the audience will have seen this and heard about it. It was on the, on the news, on the television in the UK. Um, it's Google's DeepMind AlphaFold um, prediction method that will bring many more structures um, the EBI is making them available through a, a dedicated portal. Um, they've given us 21 um, model organis org 21 organisms have been modeled already um, that DeepMind have done for us. Um, and the data is also being made available by the Elixir 3D, 3D beacons as well. But they're going to give us a whole of Uniref, um, so all the non-redundant proteins in Uniprot by Christmas. So this is some Christmas present, but it also comes with uh, lots of challenges and caveats as well. So just to summarize, and I don't, again, not gonna go into any details of the DeepMind method because I don't understand it well enough, but again, it's using this sort of natural language of uh, deep learning strategies in this sense, or in this case, they're using multiple sequence alignments rather than individual sequences that PropVert uses. Um, and this uh, allows them to also generate more uh, confident information about protein residue distances, they can generate um, good models. Um, I took this picture from this blog that's quite interesting. There's a lot on the web if you're interested in this. 
just to say that um, how do we know that these are good? Well, again, there's an independent um, assessment, not just like CAFA, but CASP has been going much longer than CAFA. Um, and I, I'm not showing you all the results, just the last, since 2006, you can see these are the top ranked methods, what their score was. And you can see it was sort of, there weren't many improvements for quite a while until AlphaFold uh, came on the scene a few years ago. And then people started to think this looks like a really interesting strategy, this, these deep learning approaches. And in fact, last year, there was this really significant improvement by AlphaFold. So, I mean, not only did it outperform the other methods, but you can see it's approaching an accuracy where for some cases, and I think crystallographers have agreed with this, it's as good as an experimental model. That's some cases. So there are caveats. They're not, not all the models are going to be wonderful, but a lot of the models are reasonably good quality and certainly higher quality than other methods. Um, so we want to use this alpha fold data because obviously this will help us bring structural information into our functional families. It will allow us to understand how changes in structure do change function. So we have a lot of data that AlphaFold has made available. Most of the data looks like this, <laughs> sort of heap of spaghetti. Um, and you don't know where the domains lie. That's the first challenge. Where are the domains within the protein? But we have workflows that already help us with that. So I told you that we have hidden Markov model profiles, patterns, if you like, that we can scan sequences again to, to find out where our structural domains lie, where the CAF domains lie. We also have HMMs for PFAM as well. And we have an algorithm that allows us to take all the hits we get to these models and to find out the best resolved set of domains that we can put onto, onto a protein sequence. And so once we've done that, we can take that heap of spaghetti and we can see, we can start to see where the domains lie. They become much clearer. So in yellow are domains that can be assigned to CAS superfamilies where we have at least one structure and we can very quickly get structural matches to these alpha fold regions and, and pull these into CAF. This is very quick and, and trivial to do. What's harder are these regions that we never were able to match to CAF. They don't map, but they don't map using our HMMs. Uh, they could be very, very, very distant homologs of CAF, but we don't know. Um, but they are um, classified in PFAM, so we can take the PFAM sequence region for them. And these regions in blue, we have no idea. They don't map to CAF, they don't map to PFAM. So, so what are they? And for these blue and green ones, that means we have to then take the alpha fold structure and scan against the whole of CAF. And CAF's got half a million structures in it. And there are some tricks you can do, but it still takes a long time to do the scanning. So again, we went back to Burkhardt's group for some help with this. And we took the sequence the embeddings we had for all the CAF superfamilies. Um, using um, proper T5, and we use them to generate uh, or to build a predictor. Actually, we could use a very simple predictor, even using logistic regression, you get pretty good results as well. So we could see that using this predictor, we can bring, and these are very remote homologs we're classifying now in this test. So these, these homologs that we, uh, this test we used, nothing had more than 20% sequence identity. They were very, very remote homologs. And yet we could still see we're getting close to 90% accuracy. So these deep learning strategies are very powerful ways of capturing um, evolutionary and structural relationships. Um, so that allows us to take all the, uh, the unknown bits, the, the green and the blue from here, to scan them against our CAF embedding or CAF E predictor, um, work out which ones belong to a CAF superfamily. And that means we can then use structure comparison methods and we can, we can trim down the search even further because we can take the sequence it, the structures that are closest by sequence embedding distance as well. That allows us to make it even faster. And we've used some very nice uh, tools. FoldSeq is a, a very nice new tool by Martin Steinegger and his group. Very, very fast, the fastest structure comparison method I've used, uh, but not as sensitive as TM Align. And TM Align is not as sensitive as SSAP. And, and these get slower as you go forward. So um, we've finished all the FoldSeq scans, but not all the SAP scans yet. And then we can decide whether these, these unknown regions, these green and blue regions, can we pull them into CAF or, or not? Um, and this is the answer so far. So we've had this data for about four, four or five weeks. So we don't have all the organisms. We ha actually, we have all the organisms partially scanned, but I'm only showing you this data for human because we won't have the full results for another, another three or four weeks, I don't think. And for human, you can see there's quite the, this, this pie, 
chart is all the domains in the human genome. Um, quite a lot there's a known structure for already, because obviously there's a great interest in human as an organism. Um, for these ones, we can see that we knew these already belonged to CAS because we had an HMM match and we can get an alpha fold structural match very easily. These ones were PFAM, these ones in a darker blue were PFAM, but our CAF embedding strategy brought them in and we can see very clearly there's an alpha fold match. For these pale blue, we're still running the SSA P scans, I'm afraid, and they, they're more sensitive and they're slower. But we're expecting a lot of these to come in because our CAF E predictor is, is really quite accurate. So that leaves quite a lot of mystery proteins. Um, and there's, a, a, there's quite a few thousand domains within this. I don't think these are all likely to be novel structural superfamilies or novel folds. There are challenges with the alpha fold data. Um, we can see that sometimes the model quality is not good. And when the model quality is not good, we won't be able to match it very easily to a CAS structural domain. We can also see that sometimes the PFAM sequence regions don't correspond to a whole domain. They correspond to perhaps half a domain or one and a half domains. So that's going to confound it as well. And also we know that we have to do manual curation for some very, very, very distant homologs. And it's taken us 25 years to do that for the amount of data we have in CAF at the moment. And we probably have about double of that, but we've tried to process in a month. So I'm, I'm not going to make any statements about this gray area. I think there's some interesting new structural families in it and some interesting new folds, but um, we need to do some more research for that. What I will show you, which I think is very exciting, I'm showing you here the top 30 superfamilies in CAF. And I, what we've done is to take the sequence embedding distances as a proxy for structural similarity and just see how many structural clusters do we get like that if we look at current experimental data. And that's this tiny little red line, which sometimes you can't even see it because the number of different structural clusters you get is tiny compared to the number we are now pulling in using alpha fold data. So the green is um, alpha, alpha fold that can match by H, we, map, we pull it in by HMM, we also pull it in by structure matching. Um, the yellow is PFAM that we pull in by um, CAF E and by um, structure matching. And this, this is showing me that what we're doing by bringing this alpha fold data into CAF, we're expanding our understanding of structural novelty in these functional families, something like a thousand fold. So to me, that's the most exciting thing about um, alpha fold, that it will, it will increase the structural novelty that we have in CAF and our understanding of, 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 of going from structural changes to, to changes in function. But I did also want to show this caveat. Um, and actually, uh, these dotted lines are the median. What I should have put, actually, I've, if you see, I forgot to put it. I should have put a line where it says 70. So for a value of 70, you can be sure you have a reasonable alpha fold model. And you can see that if you use the CAS families, to, um, the, the CAS families have been used to model the proteins. Uh, these have got a lot of sequence data in them and you get very good models. Um, they're all, a lot of them are above 70. When you go to these PFAM families that tend to be smaller, they don't, some of them map into CAF, some of them don't map into the CAF. They tend to be more species specific, much less sequence data available. You can see that, that the model quality starts to fall. There are quite a few models below 70. And when you look at the new FAMs, so they don't map to CAF or PFAM, you can see there are lots of models. You know, 70 is about here. I hope you can see my cursor. You can see, you know, uh, it's less than half of the models that are good quality. So we have to be careful how we use these alpha four models. So having shown you that, that's really, I, I'm sorry, I, that was a bit algorithmic perhaps, but I wanted to show you how the new technologies and the new structure I think is going to change the landscape. It's gonna change how we understand proteins, their functions, how their functions change in disease and, and, and so on. And I just want to then show a couple of examples we don't, we haven't used alpha fold for these examples, but these examples illustrate why I think that evolutionary family data and structural data is valuable for understanding uh, functions and change in function with disease. And this was something we started shortly after COVID arrived. <laughs> At that stage, there, was only, there weren't any COV2 variants. There was just the original Wuhan strain. Um, but we, we, we were interested in um, how, how that, uh, how these viruses uh, infected us. We were also interested in whether animals could be infected. 
So did animals have similar receptor proteins to human? Did they have genetic variations in those receptor proteins? Were some animals more susceptible to, to risk of infection than others? And we didn't need an alpha fold structure because there, was, there were wonderful crystal structures being solved very shortly after this, this terrible epidemic arrived, um, or pandemic rather. Um, and so we could see that, and all people also knew by that stage that this um, spike protein in, in COV-2 was responsible or contributed significantly to the infection because it bound the human ACE2 receptor. And this purple region here is the receptor, is the, is, the, is the domain in the spike protein that's most important for interacting with the receptor. So do animals have a similar ACE2 complex? Do they, do they have a similar ACE2 structure? So we could use our functional families again, and we could see that actually all the animals we were quite interested in that were in contact, in fact, a lot of animals map, their proteins map to the same functional family as human ACE2. Um, and for that reason, because we know that these fun fans are structurally very coherent, we can model those animal proteins using the human structure. Also, the sequence identities, the sequence patterns are very, very, very well conserved, um, although there are some changes. <laughs> um, so we could model 215 animal structures. And then we were interested in, you know, which, which part of the, of the structure, the ACE2 in the animal, uh, in this region here, in this binding region, do animals have the same residues or are there mutations in this region that mean the animals are less likely to be infected? Um, so first of all, you can consider the residues that are directly in contact between the ACE2. These red residues here are in contact between the animal ACE2 or the human ACE2 and the viral protein in purple. So these direct res contact residues, you can get very easily from the crystal structure. But we could see from the literature that people using these direct contact residues weren't finding any evidence of the animals that were thought to be infected being, there was no reason in these direct contact residues, these direct contact residues weren't changing enough. So we used our functional families. How did we do that? A bit like the strategy I showed you before, we took the functional family that the animals mapped to, we looked at other functional families within the same superfamily we could see positions that were highly conserved in everything, and some of these involved the direct contact residues. And we were able to pick out the residues that were shifting in different functional families. Now, these, these, are, these are sites under positive selection. These are, these are positions that, that are tolerated, the, the, the mutations are tolerated, and they're conserved within the functional family because they lead to some functional benefit. So it's these residues that we were interested in, and we could see these are in blue, um, and you can see, as I mentioned earlier, they're often allosteric. They're often not the residues directly binding, directly contacting, but the residues in contact with those residues. And they have an allosteric role whereby um, binding uh, involves conformational changes that involves, that needs flexibility in this, this secondary layer as well. Furthermore, we could see a very big cluster of these blue, of these blue residues that we predicted here. And when we ran other algorithms, allosteric site prediction algorithms, we could see that this was confirmed as an allosteric pocket that's important for the binding process. So we were able to well characterize all the residues that we thought that were important for in, bind, in the binding process. So what did we do then? We took um, the, all, the, uh, all the 215 animals that we had, and we looked to see what mutations did they have in those that larger set of residues that we predicted and the direct contact residues. And we used a very nice program by um, David Asher's group, MCSM PPI2. We actually also used Haddock to confirm it as well. And we looked to see, as you mutate from human residue to animal residues, um, what's the change in the binding energy for this complex? How does the binding energy change? And not to go into huge detail about this, but just to summarize, um, we could calculate, and I'm only showing a selection of the animals. We, we did this for 200 animals, but we could see the change in binding energy as you mutate residues in that interface region. Um, we don't know what change of binding energy is, it's good or bad. We can see the higher the, uh, the, the, higher the value in delta delta G, um, the decreasing stability of the complex, but at what value does it become so, uh, does it, is it destabilized? Be stabilized to an extent that the animals can't be infected. And here we were lucky to have a collaboration with Joe Santina at, at UCL. 
In fact, she, she'd really um, started this question in our mind because she was very interested in host range. Um, and she'd been digging through the literature and it was vast by the time we met up. I mean, I, I think after about two months, there were more than a thousand papers on this from China and all around the world where people had done experimental studies on cell lines, sometimes collecting uh, uh, in vitro, in vivo evidence, a whole range of evidence. And, and Jo went through this. She looked for multiple evidence. She looked for um, sort of multiple papers in the literature. She could see where there was ambiguity. And so it was her data that really helped us to understand whether our predictions were helpful or not. And we could see using her data that there was a very clear separation in the delta delta G values between the animals that were infected and those that weren't infected. Um, so that reassured us that this method of, of trying to separate and predict risk was, was, was quite reasonable. We could see there were some outliers, but we could see that the literature was very ambiguous about this. Sometimes horseshoe bat isn't infected in some of the studies or monoset. Um, and when I put this on to the complete set, on the, and again, this is only a subset of animals, um, you can see that it's, it's most of these uh, very, very low delta delta G values. They're, they're all, there's experimental evidence uh, for all of these. There's more ambiguity as you get to this region. But again, quite often there were multiple papers suggesting sometimes infection, sometimes not infection. Um, so with this, we were able to then draw up a sort of guide as to, actually really it was more a guide for to convince people to do perhaps some more research, in particular for animals that are very closely in contact with humans in, in the home or in a zoo. And in fact, we've seen in the literature many cases now of, of gorillas uh, being infected within zoo, within a zoo situation. Um, also tigers, I think there's a case as well. Uh, there was a report in the news last week in the UK about cats, research now and showing in cats, but actually perhaps the most um, largest one I've seen uh, I haven't shown mink here, but it's very close to ferret on this wheel. And there were cases, I think in Denmark, of uh, mink farms having to be closed through very widespread COVID infection of the animals uh, from the human keepers. So um, the World Health Organization used this study and a num number of other studies as well on, this, on experimental and, and predictive theoretical. And um, hopefully more research is being done some of these animals, it would be difficult for them to infect us, I think, just because of the way in which they exhale or um, inhale or, or, or whatever. So there are other features you need to consider as well. But in terms of whether they can bind well and whether the virus can get into their cells, I think these computational methods have, have been a, a reasonably helpful guide. And I just want to end with another way in which we've used this um, structural and evolutionary data. And this is in the context of cancer and lung cancer in particular. Um, and this is a collaboration with Charlie Swanton's group at the, at the Crick and Nikki uh, McGranahan and his group. This is a picture from him. Um, one of the issues that you have in cancer is that early on you get mutations in, in DNA repair genes and you can get, that can lead to genomic instability and lots of, lots of mutations, uh, lots of mutations can, can happen. So at the very beginning of the tumor, you find that the mutations Mutations within the cell seem to be, tend to be very similar. They're, they're these, um, and, and so you have sort of clonal similarity as it's called. But as time goes on, you get different parts of the tumor mutating in different ways. Sometimes these mutations are not harmful, they're passenger mutations. Sometimes they bring a functional benefit uh, and therefore they're under positive selection. And so these regions will grow. So you get this subclonal effect whereby some cells will have different mutations to other cells. Um, and that's something that, that Charlie's group's very interested in, this evolution of the tumor and evolution in terms of changes in mutations that you get. Um, but another thing that they're very interested in, and we were interested in seeing if our strategies could help answer this question, and that is with um, this genome instability that you get with cancer caused by these very early events, you can get other very large scale genomic events occurring like whole genome duplication. So in some cells, the whole of the genome is, is, is duplicated. Um, and, and that means that you've got multiple copies of some of, the, of, of all of the genes uh, and in some families that might be beneficial for the tumors. Uh, and in fact, with, um, sorry, with lung cancer, quite a lot of the tumors can have this whole genome doubling. And often they have a worse prognosis patients who have these. So we wanted to uh, see if our platform could help in answering the question, 
whether this genome doubling is associated with, with a, a, a high functional impact. And how did we use the functional families? Well, we use that to aggregate information so we can map all the human genomes to our functional families. This is just an example of, of one. It's the schematic isocitrate dehydrogenase. And there are multiple parallels expressed in different tissues and often driving different, uh, different cancers as a result of that. Um, but they bring information. They bring information on mutations and on, on, and on functional sites. So sometimes different structures have got different ligands bound, you get different functional site data. And because we know that these fun fans are structurally coherent, if we do have a structure, we could take all this information that we get across the relatives, uh, all the mutations, all the functional sites, we can map it onto that representative protein and the representative structure. And this just shows an example where we can, we've aggregated the functional site data that's shown in blue, this ligand binding data. Uh, we've aggregated the cancer data and we've found cancer clusters, um, but we've also used our predictions. So we've used the functional family evolutionary data to predict these additional um, ligand binding residues as well. And that allows us to, it, it's actually very helpful for rare mutations. So for example, say here, you have a very rare mutation found in only one patient. If that rare mutation falls within, a, within one of these cancer clusters, we can be more confident that it could be a driver. And we use a range of tasks, which I'm not going to go into a, in a, a lot of detail, but I've already told you about the clustering, the proximity to functional sites. We also look at whether there's a, a change in chemical property. We're not really interested in mutations that are occurring in healthy humans. So that's another important task. And that allows us to, to score the what's the functional impact event, the score, whether this mutation is likely to have a functional impact or not. Um, and we can then benchmark that against uh, known driver mutations in the cancer gene census. And it allows us to work out what is a good fee score, functional impact score. Uh, and from that, we can then select um, cases that we want to study in more detail. So in particular, we're interested in this genome doubling event. So this star here represents when the genome doubling occurs. So we're getting mutations that occur very early on, which I've described as clonal, because all the cells will have these. These are the, cell, these are the mutations that have triggered the cancer um, that, that started off. Uh, and then as time progresses, you have this divergence. You get these e e evolutionary processes where different parts of the tumor will have different mutations. And, and this is the subclonal stage that I will talk about in other slides. But we, we were interested in comparing the non-genome double tumors with the genome double tumors. We had a lot of data from the cancer genome atlas, uh, some from the, uh, the, the CRIC as well. We could map it to, we could map these sequences uh, that they had picked up with mutations to Uniprot. We then needed to map them to our functional families, but the functional family had to have a structure and it had to have known or predicted functional sites. So that really takes it down to about 16% of the original data, um, but that still gives us a lot of functional impacts, a lot of mutations with li likely functional impacts, and that can be timed. So quite a significant amount to really look and see what's going on. Um, and we could see that many of these functional impact mutations are occurring early. Um, so the blue is very early. Um, and that I, here, I'm only showing you a subset of what we found, just so that you can see, those of you who are a bit more familiar, will know that these are very well-known cancer drivers in which we're finding these functional impacts. But you can see there are some occur, occurring later on and subclonally. In fact, there's a very long tail, about 100 additional genes that we find. But quite often, we're only finding one mutation that's having a functional impact. And these are the ones that are very hard for clinicians to detect uh, that we're trying to pick up with our method. But just to get back to the question, can you tell the difference or are there differences between non-genome doubled and genome doubled? So the non-genome always on the left, the genome on the doubled on the right. And just look at the sizes in, in, in these Venn diagrams. Uh, first of all, I, I'm showing you that early on, there's, there's a lot of agreement. There's a lot of similarity between uh, non-genome uh, non doubled and genome doubled. What I'm showing you here are the families in which we find these mutated genes. And you can see there's a lot of families that are common between non-doubled and doubled. Uh, if we look at the numbers of mutations, you can see, if you look again, focus on the purple, that these are the mutations in, 
that are in common. So a lot are in common between, and these numbers are for non-genome doubles and that's for genome doubles. There's a lot in common that's happening early on. And that actually reassured us that our platform was picking up something real and these weren't artifacts because these are very independently sampled sets where we're getting a lot of agreement between our families and between the mutations. And then also if we look at the fees, the functional impact mutations, here these are the number of families in, in, in agreement and the number of mutations in agreement, the number of fees in agreement shown in purple. So the agreement is much higher than you'd expect by chance, but you can see there are some differences um, between the, the um, non-genome and, the, sorry, the non-doubled and, and the doubled. And we're digging into that, that there might be some differences in pathways that drive genome doubling, but overall there's considerable similarity in what's going on early. So it's, it's later on that the differences um, start to emerge. So here you can see, if you look at non-genome doubled, a lot of the genes and families involved are very similar to the genome doubled one. This purple region is very large here, but you can see there's a lot more going on where you have genome doubling on, on the right-hand side. And, and that's shown also in the numbers of mutations. Here it's 910 for non-genome doubled, um, and here 4,019, 4, but there's another additional 4,000, nearly 5,000, that you're only seeing in the genome doubled and which is picked up when you look at the functional impacts as well. Again, you can see this, this, th th there's a much larger effect where you have genome doubling. You get some common families and you get some common mutations that are occurring in purple, <clears throat> but you're getting many more effects with the genome doubled. So to that, that is suggesting to us, and we're still digging into the different pathways and things that are implicated with this, but we can see that even accounting for the slight difference in the size of the samples, we have something like a six, seven fold um, difference in the numbers of, of, of functional impact events that are occurring with genome doubling. And this is just one example that we took out because it's a well, well known cancer gene. Um, and actually, let me put everything on so that you can see everything. You can see actually in red the cancer clusters that we detect using our method. You can see the ligand binding sites that are shown in pink and the interface regions in, in yellow. Um, and actually, I think I showed on this, on, it's on this slide, again, we found one of these rare variants that you wouldn't pick out, I think, if you hadn't had, if you hadn't mis had this information about the clusters and the proximity to the functional site, that's reassuring me. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that the paralogs in this functional family are involved in many different cancer types and many of their functional impacts fall into these regions here. And we call these sites tunable sites <clears throat> because these are the sites that can mutate. They're under positive selection um, and they're mutating to the benefit of the, of the cancer. I think this just says that the mutations don't tend to alter the polar environment, but they're altering the flexibility um, and, uh, in the region of this pocket. So I'm sorry, I hope I haven't gone over um, I, I didn't really time this, so I hope I haven't taken too long. But what I, I did want to show you at the beginning, <clears throat> I, that I think this is a very exciting era, bringing structure into biology much more and trying to link structure with function and understand how mutations in the DNA, which translate into a change in structure, can impact on the function if they're located near functional sites. And I think AlphaFold will help and other methods, Rosettafold is also bringing some nice models in too. Um, it will help us to understand much more about how functions shift in these functional families and how we can correlate that with genetic changes. And I, I just showed a couple of examples, COVID and um, lung cancer. And the important thing is to thank my group. Actually, this isn't all of us. This is the only time we've met in the last <laughs> nearly two years. Um, so we've not been allowed back into the lab. So I'm really looking forward to and in fact, um, quite a few people aren't there because they were stranded in India or Austria or Spain or wherever, wherever they've gone back to be with their families for a while. And just to thank very much the AlphaFold people and, and particularly Sudat, who's collaborating with us from Malaysia um, and um, who've worked in also hard over the last months to try and make some sense of that data. And also the people involved in the analysis of the lung cancer, also um, Charlie Swanson's group of the CRIC. So I'll... Um, maybe should I stop sharing there and um, just thank you very much for your attention. Hope I haven't overrun too much. I think 
I was supposed to say a few things about what it's what I things that maybe challenges I found as a woman scientist, and uh, I think I, I would just like to say a couple of things that I actually I've I, it's been a wonderful life in science, and I really encourage all all the young women out there to come into science, and those of you in it to stay in it. Um, I mean, there, there there are challenges. I think if you can find the right people to first of all work for and then work with, that can make a big difference. I've been very lucky in having a very good mentor in, in Janet Thornton, but um, there are many people out there who will help you. And I think that's an important thing to do. I think it's very important to choose something that you find very exciting and, and stay with that, what, whatever's, whatever else is happening around you. And I think you're, if you have that, that, I found that finding the things that I really enjoyed helped me cope with the things that were harder. And, it is harder, I think, a, a little bit harder for a woman and anybody who might feel uh, a bit different in some ways. Um, I think um, we did a survey recently and it's still only about 25% of people in this field that are women, um, computational biologists, that is. Um, and it, it's probably even worse if, if, if for other areas of diversity. And for me, sometimes that can be hard if you're, you know, if you're sitting in a meeting and maybe you're the only woman there and, I think women do have a slightly, well, maybe this is a terrible generalization. It's not always true, but um, sometimes uh, there, you can see cultural differences in styles. And sometimes certainly I've found that I'm not very assertive. I'm quite shy and that's been a struggle for me. Um, but there are other ways in which women work that, that can be just as, as effective. So I think find the ways that work for you. I think, I think it's a good thing to speak out if you think there's something that's unfair. Um, and I think the best way of changing things that are unfair is to try and collect evidence for that. And to also to try and, you know, when you get to a position when you, where you can encourage women to join, that you play your part in that. And uh, actually here, I want, actually want to thank Al Al Alfonso Valencia and, and Burkhard Rost, who started to change the Computational Biology Society, ISCB, by bringing more women in. And that started to alter the culture but actually setting up something like uh, equality, diversity, inclusion um, committee was very important and the same in my institute. So I would encourage you to find either work in institutes where they have these equality and inclusion committees and join it and, um, or if they don't have one to start it because I found, especially at UCL, by collecting evidence on where things are not very helpful for women like hours of meetings and things like that, you can really start to change the culture. And, uh, and I think that can help women a lot. You know, get the evidence and then it's very easy to persuade people that I don't, I've never encountered any um, conscious prejudice, I don't think ever in my career. I think we all have subconscious prejudice just from what we've learned in, in our childhoods and our uh, cultural context. So we all have that, we have to be aware of that. Um, but I, I think, um, all the time, whenever I've presented evidence of something not being very fair, I've always had a very positive reaction. So I, that's my advice, three bits of advice, I suppose. Find your, your, your mentors, <laughs> find you know, the subjects you really enjoy and find ways of um, uh, uh, changing the culture around you if you need to. Um, and uh, actually I should perhaps end by saying, find a very supportive partner as well, especially if you're a woman and uh, want to start a family. I, I don't have a family, but if you do, then I think uh, having a very supportive partner is important too. I think that's my very brief summary <laughs> of, uh, and if people have got questions, I'm very happy to answer them. But um, those, those I think are important things to think about as a, as a woman scientist or anyone who feels a bit different to the majority of the scientists in the field. So I should, Stop at that point. I, I, I don't know if there are questions. Oh, hi, Al, really? hi, Alfonso. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm sorry, I was a few minutes late. Uh, Mark. Hello. Hi, I Mark. Hi, you? good to see you. Good to I'm see you too. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. One of them maybe you have tried and quick, it's um, technical. So alpha fold, I understand. I, I haven't digged too much into it because you know I'm not anymore in the protein field, but um, it provides you a profile per residue of the accuracy. Yeah. Are you guys using this 
yes. through predictions of function? Uh, we, we're using it to see whether we can use that particular site when we, when we infer functional properties, where we infer site properties. So we're using it in that context as well. Um, we're, I mean, it's quite early days, so we're doing some research on how reliable it is and comparing it with other structural information we have. So we have to do quite a lot of work there as well. Um, I mean, I, in some senses, yes, it could be used to, to highlight regions that might be more associated with functional sites. Uh, and that's something that we've started looking at, but we, we've, we've, we haven't done enough analysis of the data at the moment to be able to answer that question, but it's, it's, a very good, um, it's a very good question and it's something that's very sensible to do. I know it's, it, we're certainly also using it to find um, linker regions between domains of, and often functional sites are in more flexible regions. So we would expect that data to help us highlight those regions as well. Okay, and Thanks. the second question is, it's, it's more general. So mm -hmm. now with AlphaFold, you're sort of discovering new functions eventually. But many years ago, we always had to this, these guesses of how much we had already covered the functional space. Yeah. Were our guesses correct in the light of the huge new amount of structural data that AlphaFold is bringing into the table? In other words, let's say we predicted maybe only 10% of the function were not known yet or not predicted by CAF and PFAM and so on and so forth. But do we have more, much more of that? Well, this is a difficult question to answer. I mean, because we don't, we have such a tiny amount of real experimental data anyway. So it's all predictive and, and AlphaFold won't necessarily help us with, with that. It will help us to see that we have a rather different structural cluster that could be functionally different. And we might be able to see shifts in the sequence patterns that suggest that it's another function. But to, to capture that in some chemical sense is, is very diff difficult. Yeah. I mean, all I know, actually, and I should say that in CAF, we have more than 200,000 different functional clusters. Mm -hmm. But I should say this isn't everything, because these are ones where we have at least one experimental piece of evidence, because we wanted to know what they were or what they That's did. Mm -hmm. And there do remain sequences in CAF that haven't been clustered yet into functional families. Um, and where we, we can map um, alpha fold models onto those. And we, we will be able to see what the changes are in these regions. Usually across a superfamily, the functional pockets for binding anyway, are very highly conserved. The interfaces vary a lot. And that's quite exciting for me to see how that's gonna change with the alpha fold data. But we can certainly look across these pockets that are involved in enzymes and see how, this, how the alpha fold, whether the alpha fold data can make sense of what we see in changes in the sequence patterns in these in these new clusters that we're yeah. annotating with structural data. So, and maybe having that additional data, we can build predictors like these. Deep, there may be enough information for deep learning strategies even to predict with some confidence whether you've definitely got a shift in function when you see mutations in these particular structural regions. So, um, so I think. I think there's for young, for young people coming to this area, there's huge, exciting challenges, um, data and new technologies that will allow us to start on answering these questions about, um, you know, how much different chemical space do we have out there? I mean, I think chemistry, I should also say that I don't think the chemistry, I think we probably know a lot about most of the chemistry that's done. So it's a case of how, when these pockets change, it's not that new chemistry is being done most of the time, it's new chemistry on a different compound. And something I'd hoped to talk about, but we didn't have the experimental results. We're looking in the sea at bacteria that degrade plastic, a particular enzyme. And we're looking to see, we're using this data to see how mm -hmm. the pockets change. And so that kind of information, it's not new chemistry. These enzymes are all degrading plastic, but some of them do it better, faster, more effectively. And some of them combine different types of plastic. So it's not the chemistry, it's the things that, the enzymes that act upon that we'll learn more about. You know, can we can we predict what different ligands will fit into these pockets? That's where the alpha fold data will really help us. I, I hope. I mean, given the caveats, and there's sense. still a lot of research to be done on alpha fold data. I've shown you that for some families, you need to have a, you know you need to have enough sequences to learn the characteristics to be able to predict the structure. 
um, and where you don't have where it's where it's more species specific the family and there's not very many um, uh, the species that have that sequence it's very much harder to predict a good quality model but I think there are strategies now that are overcoming that as well so I think that will change in the next five years too so I think for people interested in protein evolution function um, this structural data is going to open a whole new world to those people yeah it seems that uh, obviously I'm that. super biased <laughs> It seems that they left the field a bit too early. <laughs> well, I don't know. No, I mean, I think these techniques will apply in many areas of biology. And, yeah, um, definitely. Thank you, Christine. Thank you for the question. Uh, we have more questions, Ramon. I can't hear you, Ramon, sorry. Sorry? I can't, I can't hear you. Maybe we move to Eduard while you are solving your next problem, Ramon. Hi, Christine. Thank you Hi. very much for your talk. It Thank was, you. It was very That's nice. Good. So I noticed that in the, I'm also going to the alpha full part. So I noticed that you have a part of, 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 of CAF assignments that they have a PFAM domain, but you don't have the alpha fold model or it's not a good quality yet. So, well, we don't know. Many of the many of the PFAM domains do have good quality. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, they do, but some of them didn't. Yeah, you're, you're talking about that plot where we could see that there were yes. quite a lot that didn't have good quality. So I was wondering, have you looked into the Rosetta Fold domains for... for yes, for actually, I, ha I, ha I had a whole set of... I had extra slides, but I could see, and I'm sorry, my talk was too long already, so I took out the Rosetta Fold ones. All so right. we modeled the whole of, we took all the alpha fold human proteins, but we'd also, we also have all the Rosetta fold because we collaborated with, with, with David Baker and we mm -hmm. built all those models. Um, and actually I had some slides, I can't show you, but where for CAS, the alpha fold and Rosetta fold, they have similar, similar quality in the models, very similar quality. Okay. So you have a lot of information for those families. Uh, again, for the PFAM, Alpha fold tends to have slightly, does have more good models than Rosetta fold. Um, but, but even so, what we could see actually, I should say, is that there are quite a lot of, of models that are much better for Rosetta fold than alpha fold. Um, I should have kept that slide in because it's quite interesting in a way. So you shouldn't, I mean, I think where you're talking about small families where there's perhaps less information. The, the alpha fold metric is not very good, it should always be above 70. Then you can look at Rosetta fold as well. We could see there were lots of families where the, the alpha fold model wasn't particularly good, but Rosetta fold had built a bit a good model. Mm -hmm. And even more so for the new fan families, where we could see that, you know, actually it was about half and half whether we would use alpha fold or Rosetta fold. Okay. So, mm -hmm. uh, but they're, they're both methods are struggling in those areas but it, you might want to compare both strategies if, if to get some to see if there's some agreement which would give you more confidence mm -hmm. yeah thanks and, and then i don't know if i have a time for a second question go, go 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 so um you didn't cover that exactly in your talk but once you have a, a multi-domain protein have you looked into how well the alpha fold models uh, predict the interdomain interfaces? Yes, we have. <laughs> okay. We have because we were hoping that we could use the, there's, a, there's something called the PAE score, and we were hoping we could use that to chop the domains. We thought, well, uh -huh. just use that score to chop the domains. And we did, I mean, this is why it's taken us five weeks and we've only finished human, really, because we did, we've had to do quite a bit of research along the way. So we looked at that first, and somebody's written a very nice script that program that we used. I can't remember the name of it, I'm afraid. We used that as well, which exploits that data. Mm -hmm. uh, and we benchmarked it. And, and at the moment, and it might be the algorithm we use, you know, we've had to do it quickly. It's, it's rather disappointing. We benchmarked it just on two domain proteins, which you would expect it to get right quite mm -hmm. often. Most of the time it was predicting a single domain. When it did split into two domains using that, that metric, Mm -hmm. we could see that the boundaries were very shifted, you know, by a hundred residues or 50, you know, so there was, there was, that's why we went back to our cath resolve hit strategy. Cause we knew, we know from benchmarking that we can cut 
a uniport sequence quite easily into CAS and PFAM regions. But we then do have this problem that PFAM isn't a structure-based resource. So quite often the PFAM domains don't coincide with a whole structural domain. As I said, sometimes they're half or sometimes they're one and a half. Or, and so then we've got to go back and do some, we've got to do some work on those. That, that mystery question mark gray bit in my plot, that's not necessarily new families and new folds. It's also some missed, missed matches because the PFAMs don't match quite right because they don't really correspond to a proper structural domain. Thank you very much, Christine. Thanks, thanks very much for your questions. So, Ramon, could you yeah, close he's your mic? Now? Oh, yeah, great. Nice, nice working. Oh, please. Good, thank you. <laughs> so, um, I was I was saying that in 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 the intrinsically disordered proteins community, we always highlight that they they are very involved in in transcription and signaling, and therefore they're very relevant in cancer and so on. Yeah. Um, However, they, they have low sequence similarity and, and they don't yeah. have a, one single code the structure, although, of course, the, the structure or the ensemble of the structures uh, do play a, a role. So um, how do they fit in your workflow? Can you identify these functional mutations in cancer or? Yes, or yes. And, and there are mutations in disordered regions. And uh, um, actually we've used um, MobyDB, we have, so we, we've mapped on all the disordered regions as well. And I think actually MobyDB or is it MobyLite, I think Uniprot's providing this data. They have taken all the alpha fold models now and predicted all the disordered regions. So I completely agree that the disordered regions can be very important too. I mean, some of these disordered regions are actually quite uh, are loopy regions near the functional sites that I was showing. So again, that's, that strategy we use can still be helpful for picking out more flexible regions that would be predicted as disordered, where quite often the, the catalytic residues are often within those regions and other, other uh, residues are imp of importance to the function are often in those regions. So we don't label them as such, but we those disordered re uh, regions are very important for the function as well. And they, they would be within the domain and the functional region that we're looking at when we analyze the cancer mutations too. So that's a very important point that I, I should have made. They can be quite flexible and quite disordered, the, those residues. Quite often the ones I showed you like with the COVID, the allosteric ones that are buried, um, those ones are not the disordered ones. Those allosteric regions, they're, they're, they're often highly contacted or connected residues within the protein structure. And they can be very important for function as well. And that they're, they're um, much harder to detect as well, I think. But you're you're right. You know, very so quite a lot of important functional regions are flexible and disordered. Yeah. Thanks very much for pointing that out. Thanks. Thank you. If there are no more questions, I have a couple of a couple of them. So. In, one, of, one of them is, uh, is on the on this disorder regions that and it's a comment more than a question to see what you what you think the 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 people working in dna binding proteins they say that the alpha fold is producing the best spaghetti of the, in the world <laughs> <laughs> all, the DNA binding, all the dna binding proteins are like you know, something with a lot of uh, disorder regions so i think that we are um Obviously, this, this region will become order once they are binding to DNA or to the other yeah. DNA binding proteins. So I think yeah. that there is a big, uh, still a big gap in between what we understand, yes. you know, oh, oh, what alpha fall or the other, uh, uh, David Becker can, can do uh, yeah. Yeah, I, in, I, in isolated yeah. proteins and in context, no? when, they, when the things are- I like completely in, agree. Um, I completely agree, Alfonso. I mean, I'm- Obviously, I'm I'm kind of biased to looking at globular domains where the function is is much easier to characterize. And half of CAS are enzymes, where you've got nice big pockets that you you okay. The there are disordered flexible regions where sometimes the catalytic residues lie, but but mostly it's you, the the, uh, the the pocket can be very easily defined and and modeled as well. So for a lot of the things I'm looking at, I I don't have this problem, but a lot of um, mutations in cancer will will map to DNA binding uh, residues as well. So in those cases, you're you're absolutely right. Um, the the models aren't don't seem to be so reliable, um, and that's something that 
hopefully there will be mechanisms for improving that. I don't know enough about the algorithms to know how what additional data they would need to to change that. But it but it but it is a caveat. And as I showed you, that the models aren't all perfect um, from our preliminary. I wanted I wanted to ask you about the, about this because I, I'm not sure if I understand this uh, understood this well. So when you show that for the for the cast you know, goods families. The, the the average quality of the models is pretty high, but then when they, they are you know other less uh, less good families, then the the quality was le was uh, clearly less 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 good. Yeah, I, I, this is because they are. I didn't understand why. Is this well, because I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure. I, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I understand why. I think it's just the amount of sequence information we have for those families. So, you know, a very, um, those um, cast families are much bigger than PFAM families anyway, because we get all the evolu evolutionary relatives. And because we, we, because we have so many evolutionary relatives, I think it's easier for these deep learning methods to, to sort of capture the characteristics that are needed to predict the structure as well. Um, oh, we found this with Rosetta Fold as well. We found exactly the same phenomenon where um, proteins that come from these sort of larger, more highly populated families seem to be better models. They, they tend to fit the general characteristics that, that these deep learning methods are extracting. Um, and you can get more unusual structural arrangement, where you, but you need to have enough sequences to capture that. And the PFAM families tend to be less highly populated, more species specific. I don't know if that's so. Like so I, I, so you're, you're saying no. This was a, this was what I was trying to 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 ask or to understand is. So you would say that there's more the diversity on the think, sequences I, than the number of sequences because clearly it's not the number of sequences. I think I think it's to do with the diversity. Um, I might be wrong. That's just my hypothesis, Alfonso. I don't know. I mean, I need to talk to or maybe an expert in you know. David Jones or someone at UCL who's in, who's been working on these methods as well may have some mm -hmm. explanation for that. But it seemed very pronounced comparing PFAMs and the plum fams even more pronounced, where you know, often the, those have more disorder as well. So that might be that might be another thing contributing that these mm -hmm. um, these these families these PFAM and NUFAM families that don't that have never mapped to CAS. It, it may be that we don't have good structural representatives because the crystallographers haven't been able to solve them. So we, you know, that that region of structure space hasn't been covered. So the deep learning methods don't have sequences from those regions of structure space that would help them to learn the I characteristics. See, I see. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Too. I think oh, it could right. be that. Yeah, yeah, could be too. All, all, all of this together at the same time. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's. I mean, I think people are just start, starting. It's. It's quite new this data. And, um, I know there's a, lots on Twitter, but <laughs> but um, we're trying to do it more slowly. And you know, we, we want to bring the stuff into CAF carefully, so we don't we don't want to sort of get a hack something no. together to get an answer on the number of new folds. So I will not be giving that answer. Many people have asked me, but that answer will be slow in coming. Okay, my my, my last one is a, is also is a, is a, a philosophical comment. It's, uh, all this the analysis that you show for the cancer mutations is interesting, and I understand you know the implications for predicting, helping in the prediction of the you know, uh, rare events, for example. Still, are we not being uh, to uh, single residue focus uh, in general in the in all these interpretations? No, because it's true these mutations can happen one by one, yeah. but in general they are more. I mean, not only for the cancer mutations in general, for all this interpretation, including the binding sites, that you yeah. know, they are more um, collective proper properties and individual properties. And I, I don't, I, yeah, I, think I, I just wonder. I think, I, I, I think you're right. And I mean, what I present is quite a simplistic strategy, really. And you're right. It's just focusing on the individual. Um, I, 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 and I don't know, I mean, we, we haven't looked beyond that enough for me to, to consider whether you're, I mean, are you considering something like an emergent property that happens when you have um, mutations scattered across the protein that certainly that could destabilize it in some way. So its function is affected in that sense um, or that 
you know, perhaps it's constrained in its movements for that reason or whatever. I think that's, I think that's very possible. Um, I think also you might need to have an accumulation of mutations within these pockets for them to be significantly affected as well. And that's something that, that, that we didn't consider. I mean, we, we really just started with this simple question of whether we did get more functional events occurring you know, when you have genome doubling. And we, we sort of expected it, but it hadn't been looked at and it hadn't been shown. And, and we weren't sure. I mean, there are other things that happen with genome doubling. Once you have that level of genomic instability, there are all kinds of other things that could be making the cancer more aggressive. You get all sorts of changes to the DNA that, that could be problematic. So we really just wanted to ask that simple question, you know, do, do we no, actually- what, uh, nothing, you know, nothing against that. I'm just wondering if there will be another way of incorporating more. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very interesting mm -hmm. idea actually, that it, 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 could, it, it, it could be more of some kind of emergent property when you have, and, it, and they could be distributed mutations in that case where you have destabilization of the protein as well. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That would be, yeah. That's a good point. Thank you, Christine. If there are no more questions, we already passed the hour. So, we thanks, uh, well, first, we thanks all the attendees because we yes. collected a number of people from uh, from different places, not only from the BSC, that are most welcome. And it's good to see to see them. I see Damian Devos in some point appearing in one of the mains. And, so oh, that's Patrick, great. Patrick and, uh, and Mark and others. So, you, you, you know, Congratulations, Christine, because you attracted a, a, a number of uh, oh, no, no, non people that are not just on your seminars, and we are very happy to see them, even if it's only. I think they're a the, wonderful the idea, Alfonso, and, and yeah, good luck with the success of the program. Um, I don't know if I said enough about being a woman scientist, but if, if people. I, do think, that, I think you, I think, I think you, say, you say a, num a number of interesting questions, and, and uh, we are happy. Uh, to have you uh, supporting the program too, that is uh, becoming an increasingly important well, activity. I was going to say, for, if, for, anybody, for, for um, if anybody was too shy, or like me, I'm shy, so I understand that, too shy to ask about that, um, please email me if you've got any problems of, or want some advice as a woman scientist. Uh, I'm very happy to answer your questions, so please write to me. Uh, I don't know, because I, you know, I'm very sorry because I missed the introduction and I don't know if I was uh, clear enough that Christine is now the president of ICB and she's uh, started this uh, equality um, task force. So, well, actually, no, that was that has been uh, before me. I think I think you you and Buckard sowed the seeds of that, to be honest. Um, well, the seed, but the, the, actual, <laughs> the actual functioning is now, and then the, 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 the first, the first. And I think uh, it's, first, I think it started a few years. It started before me. me. Yeah, it started be, before me, but I, I I really supportive of it. I think it's. As, as I mentioned, Christine I think, says she's a very shy person. She would not recognize that she has been pushing this uh, for, for this year. But I think it's a, it's a very, no, it's a very interesting. Uh, it's, it's important, a, it's actually. A, it, 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 actually, if you don't way. mind, Alfonso, it does give me the chance to persuade people to nominate women for our awards and honors for the society. I mean, um, we have a really big problem that the people, the women who are nominated are wonderful. And we've had a good balance of men and women being awarded prizes and uh, fellowships. Um, but we don't have enough women being nominated and, this, and then we don't have other areas of diversity being nominated enough either. Um, so uh, that's an appeal to people in the audience to think about very good candidates that are a bit different from what you see normally. Um, hit the diversity button and, and send us some more candidates. That'd be wonderful. Okay, thank you. And with this uh, quote, we thank uh, Christine once again. And, uh... Thanks for inviting me. Bye-bye.